Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Blame Game. This week we'll focus on Dude Mario and his questionable performances as of late while attempting to climb the North American ranked ladder. Now, Dude Mario used to be praised as one of the hyper carries on this Church of Chang lineup, however it appears since the addition of Demacian IRL, things haven't gone so well for the Danish mid laner. This seemingly abrupt turn of events has caused Mr. Mario to find himself on the receiving end of a lot of criticism as of late, with many reddit comments discussing his poor performances and even his teammate Wasabivian's one calling out his bad plays. This all culminated in him deciding on his own volition to take a month long vacation from League entirely. Let's take a look at a exactly how bad this was though, and if fans should be concerned about the rest of the season. So in this first game, Dude Mario is on his jungle Viego, while the rest of the red team has also opted for very heavy teamfight dive champs. It's really up to Dude Mario which side of the map he wants to prioritize, as in this draft, either can end up being the win con for this game. However, things start going pretty poorly during an attempted gank onto the Garen at level 3. While this play does look favorable from this position and can succeed, there is a pretty large minion wave built up that can do considerable damage at this stage of the game. It's also important to note the discrepancies between the two top laners, as since Aurelia roamed mid earlier, she's a level down on Garen and left without ignite. Dude Mario actually ends up playing this pretty poorly by jumping the gun without potentially letting Demacian thin out the wave a little bit or build up stacks of his passive. This engage is also quite lackluster, as instead of charging up W for a greater stun duration, he instead opts to let it cast at a much earlier time, before proceeding to not consume the passive mark for extra damage due to him cancelling an auto and then whiffing his Q entirely. Then, in what appears to be a bit of incoordination or lack of communication, Demacian continues to chase while Dude Mario backs off, ultimately leading to a kill for the Garen. I will admit though that this is just a bit of a nitpick, as this doesn't really affect the state of the game since due to Demacian's kill earlier, he is able to get a vamp scepter, becoming full build and ultimately solo killing the Garen afterwards. However, this lack of mechanical awareness is a recurring theme that happens a lot during this game, especially in teamfights. In this fight here, Dude Mario once again fails his W and generally plays it pretty poorly by not hitting a single ability or auto attack except for a Q and Red Smite and up dying with ult available, which ultimately leads to his team getting wiped in 0 for 3 where Seraphine and Yonoi survive on a fraction of health. This next fight of respawn is played a bit better, with red team managing to burst down Seraphine, however Dude Mario prematurely uses his ult after she is already dead, and while that isn't too bad on its own, it ends up costing him later, when he has no resets and no ult available when both Sejuani and Yonoi were within kill range. However, with all that being said, I personally wouldn't actually attribute Dude Morrow's actions to solo losing his team those fights, because in fact, both those skirmishes in the bot river were 3v4s, from Yone rotating to join the action, while Nico stayed mid to push the tower as a Nico, which I shouldn't even have to explain why that is suboptimal. Even when the action is literally right under her nose and the fight seems so winnable, she seems insistent on staying mid for some unknown reason while her team gets wiped twice. But that isn't to say Dude Mario is completely off the hook, as he generally just looks like he feels really uncomfortable playing Viego and doesn't know what he should be doing. A point which is made clear a few minutes later, where after Aurelia and Garen gets killed in a bot lane, he ends up blowing his flash for basically no reason, trying to walk up in a 1v3. This mistake quickly proves pretty costly, as in the ensuing 2v2, he gets hard focused by Yone, who deletes him before he has a chance to run away and wait for the peel, and once again, missing the W and ult is not a good look either. Finally, his last death in this game is probably the worst of all and a big head scratcher for many fans. He decides to randomly invade Sejuani's topside jungle, seemingly choosing to ignore both using the Scryer's plan to get vision on if there is even anything to take, or the vision he does have on the bot side jungle, which suggests both Yone and Sejuani are currently MIA, to which he ends up getting caught with his pants down and sent back to the fountain once more. So overall, I have to say that I agree with the criticisms regarding Dude Mario's Viego mechanics and his playmaking overall. While I don't believe he's the sole reason Red Team lost that game, he just currently looks pretty clueless on what he should be doing to impact their play, and definitely needs to clean that up if he wants to help his team win games. And it's not just that he's not used to his role of champion, as jungle is the second most played position in flex after top, of which 20 of the jungle games have been on Viego. Okay, but many would argue that jungle is one of his weaker roles, and Dude Mario in the mid lane is really where it's at. So now let's take a look at his performance on the mid lane Yone, a champion many would consider as his strongest, and definitely how he made a name for himself on the Church of Chang lineup. This game, he has drafted the Yone as a counterpick to the enemy Malsahar, a matchup which you should be expecting the Yone to be winning out pretty heavily, and outright stomping pre-6, especially with players of this caliber. But this doesn't really happen, 
as this lane turns out to be incredibly passive, with basically zero all-ins happening, which Malzahar will be pretty happy to just sit there and free farm. And the few times he does decide to go in are pretty poor. Here, he decides to use everything to try and kill Malzahar after level 6, despite being ganked by Belveth quite literally 3 seconds ago, costing him both his flash and life. Not only that, as Dude Mario is also somehow beat to reacting to plays around the map, getting outroamed by the Malzahar leading to a lack of control in both sides of the river. One thing I will give him credit for though is this roam to the bot lane, which even though ended up being a 1 for 3, was mostly the Zyra's fault not his, as this play really took misfortune out of the game, and I mean that completely literally, as she went afk not long after. But overall, I just wish he played a bit more aggressive in this game, as he had quite a few opportunities to make plays happen that he just didn't capitalize on. Once again, it just feels like somehow he isn't comfortable with his matchup, which is shown pretty evidently during this exchange before 16 minutes. However, if we're being honest here, this outcome could be much worse, as his team does start to win around the map later in the game through towers and kills, and despite the even lane, this Malzahar doesn't really become useful later in this game. But the one thing you really have to be cognizant of here is this 9 in 1 Belveth who is going to be super hard to deal with without a super strong frontline or burst damage dealers. Furthermore, the lack of early game pressure and awareness has led to the red team being one drag away from Hextag Soul thanks to their early dragon stacking. But I think if we look at this game from a whole, it wasn't solely dude Mario's fault it quickly got out of control. Set for one had a laning phase that was just as bad if not worse, which gave Darius way too much agency and made himself basically useless anywhere outside of pushing the lane. His macro as a whole just seemed incredibly sloppy, seemingly not knowing where to be at times. Oftentimes he would try way too hard to force a play and end up just getting killed because he got caught in no man's land. He also seemed somehow allergic to grouping which makes sense normally for a set with TP, but it just seemed like he would completely ignore his team in a very few important fights. The bot lane was also pretty uninspiring, going relatively even in laning phase, but not really being too useful in team fights or anything like that. With Zyra often offering very little to help her team by playing way too far back and never even hitting more than one enemy with her ult. Other times, she just looks like she's straight up inting. However, the most egregious member on the entire blue team, which I don't really see anyone talking about, has to be the Mordekaiser. His early game was arguably alright, but his decision making later in the game was quite a sight to behold, and I don't mean that in a good way. Many times it just seemed like he didn't know what he should be doing on his champion, and his alt usage was incredibly awful. His first visit to the bot lane, instead of doing anything to secure the kill on Misfortune, he instead turns on the Senna, waiting for her to flash away before doing his combo. But instead of using their superior numbers and HP to their advantage in this 3v2, he decides to ult Tenna, making it a 1v1, and since she is already at her tower, she and MF are both able to get away. And same thing here, not ulting the Belveth in time to save his Zyra, but instead doing it to turn the 2v1 with Ezreal into a 1v1 with the completed item Belveth, which he ends up losing. Then, right off respawn, he misplaced this fight against the Darius by wasting his abilities and health fighting the Grump at first. Uh, you get my point, but the main reason I wanted to point out Mordekaiser was because just like Set, his positioning was not the greatest, but it was probably even worse for him. There are quite a few examples of this, such as this seemingly random invade when everyone on the red team knew he was there, which baits his team in and causes Ezreal to lose both of his summoners, or this completely unnecessary tower dive against the incredibly fed Belveth. But the worst one of all was the fight for the Hextech Soul, where instead of grouping with his team coming from mid, Mordekaiser decides to go for a flank to the Tribush, in which he gets turned on by all four members of the red team, effectively giving over the soul for free. So it's for all those reasons that I've just mentioned that I'll actually have to disagree with the criticism towards Dude Morrow in this second game. I truly believe he was not at fault for what happened here and it was really just a team diff. In all honesty, he's a pretty solid player with a long legacy of success, so I don't think anyone should let these two off games be too much of a damper on what has otherwise been a pretty exciting Dude Mario hype train. Overall, his laning and playmaking in the mid lane is almost always second to none, with just a few kinks that may need to be ironed out. While I do agree that his jungling is not quite the greatest, there is still a lot of room to improve, and Dude Mario has shown a lot of progress in that regard. That's gonna do it for this episode of The Blame Game, thank you all so much for watching, Dude Mario is back in NA and ready for action, so hope you're all really excited about that. Hopefully this team can go back to their winning ways or at least find their form again. Who knows, maybe after coming back from this expedition, he'll have grown a few centimeters in height or something along those lines, but yeah, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Hello, I'm out from the LCS, I'm sitting down because it's a hot day in Los Angeles, 
and uh, I need to keep cool. And you know what else needs to be cool? Your computer. Which is why you should check out Alienware, because they've got some of the best cooling tech in the biz for both desktops and notebooks, so that your computer can stay cool while you're staying cool by having an Alienware, which is also cool. And watching this content, that is also cool. And if you just say a word so often, so many times, that it starts to lose a... There's like, like a significance. It like starts to sound weird in your mouth and like... Uh, there's a word for that, and I am... Um... Anyways, there's a link in the description below. Check it out.